I'm JB Wogan from Mathematica, and I am delighted to welcome everyone here today for our event, Working to Advance Health Equity, a dialogue with our research and HR teams. This afternoon, you're going to hear from an excellent lineup of knowledgeable and experienced people on working in health equity research at Mathematica. But today's event is a two-way conversation and we definitely want to hear from you too. So as questions and comments come to mind, be sure to share them in the comments section so that our experts can respond. We want to provide a space for people to learn and connect with Mathematica's dynamic experts and HR professionals to shine a light on this important work that hopefully encourages you to become a part of it. So without further ado, I want to introduce our experts. Delia Wesley uh, is Mathematica's Senior Director of Health Equity. Delia leads the development of our health equity practice and portfolio, applying an equity lens to every aspect of our work through research and improved programs. Hi, Delia. Hi, JB. We also have Kara Zivin who is a senior health researcher at Mathematica focused on clinical, functional, and quality of life outcomes for vulnerable people with behavioral health conditions, including women with perinatal period, older adults, and veterans. Excuse me, including women in the per perinatal period, older adults, and veterans. Welcome, Kara. We're also joined by Sarah Leaf, who is a researcher at Mathematica focused on promoting equity and behavioral health treatment for children, adolescents, and adolescents with low incomes. Her work focuses on uncovering how structural and systemic changes can be made to advance health equity. Thanks for joining us, Cara. Uh, sorry, so, thanks for joining us, Sarah. Uh, we're also joined by So O'Neill, a senior researcher and director of the Health Philanthropy Portfolio at Mathematica, whose work focuses on providing evidence to reduce health disparities and promote health equity for people, regardless of race, gender, religion, socioeconomic status, geography, and other visible and invisible characteristics. Welcome so. We also have with us today, uh, Corinne Petersick, who is Mathematica's Director of Talent Acquisition she leads our efforts to identify and bring on board the researchers and analysts that make our work possible. And finally, to round out our excellent group of experts, <clears throat> we have uh, Ife Alaure, who uh, is the Associate Director of Talent Acquisition at Mathematica and oversees recruitment for the Health and Administration Divisions with a focus on the human experience at work and the development of dignified and equitable recruitment processes. Okay, well, welcome, Ife. Let's uh, let's get down to the discussion. So we're talking about health equity research today, and I thought maybe a first, a good first question is, how are we defining health equity research? What is health equity research? Delia, do you want to start us off here? Happy to, um, JB. And so I think it is a great first question. And I would say, um, you know, it depends on how you define health equity, right? Of which we know there are lots of definitions out there um, that are used, but one that resonates most with me, and I think a lot of our staff here at Mathematica um, and many of our clients is generally the, the definition of health equity, that it's a state where everyone has the opportunity to attain and maintain um, their highest achievable or full potential in terms of health and well-being. And that's regardless of, um, you know, without being disadvantaged from achieving that based on their social position or other socially determined circumstances. And so health equity research with that in mind asks key questions or generates evidence about what it takes to achieve that or what prevents that in some cases. You might be muted. <laughs> 100% correct. I was had to happen to somebody. Okay. Um, before we move on, does anyone else have anything to add in terms of how they think about defining health equity research? Yeah, I, I can add a little something. I mean, I think that what Delia said is right on. And so when you're starting to think about health equity research and thinking about 
how to support people achieving their their best lives or their best health and having the opportunity to do that it's it really comes down eventually to addressing and redressing historical structures and policies um so i, I think that that is very important when you think about health equity research is thinking about addressing root causes i'm seeing some nodding heads sarah was there anything you had to add I yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with all that's been said. I think when I thought of this question, something that came to mind is also when we think about the process of conducting health equity research, what does that look like? Um, and, you know, ideally it involves reflection and transformation in the process of research itself and in the researcher. Um, so, you know, that can mean a lot of different things. Um, as a researcher, acknowledging your positionality, your privilege, and how that impacts the research that you're doing. Um, thinking about the ways that our data collection processes or analytical tools have been, like Joe said, been based in sort of how things have been done historically and, and the ways in which those things should change. Okay. Uh, Kara, is there anything else you would like to add? Or Sure, I can just add, and I agree with my, my colleagues. Um, when I think about the research component of this question, I think about um, developing and evaluating evidence-based solutions to health differences that have been driven by social, economic, and environmental factors with a focus on solutions rather than focusing on problems. Okay, excellent. I'm seeing some great comments in the chat, and Shane adds that uh, uh, at the Virginia Office of Health Equity that uh, they think of a similar way and would add that it's the attainment of the highest level of health for all people, which is a nice way of thinking about it. So I think the second question, I imagine uh, many of the people who are on this call are interested in working in health equity research if they aren't already and might benefit from hearing a little bit about your respective stories on how you got involved in health equity research. So um, let me turn it back to Delia. What, how did you get started? What was what's sort of the origin story, your superhero origin story for health equity researcher? Superhero origin, so a long time ago. Um, so for, for me, so this has actually been my whole career, um, starting with graduate studies and training in public health, um, specifically in epidemiology and um, training as a health disparities researcher, which is what we were focusing on back then. Um, and that led to doctoral training and what, like I said, we were then talking about is health disparities, but what has evolved to be the field that we're in now. Um, and I worked as an embedded health services researcher within a large um, health system doing health equity research um, in different clinical contexts. So doing research with clinical teams um, to develop and test interventions that would improve care delivery, particularly for communities that have been historically marginalized um, or you know, patients from communities that had been disinvested. So I spent over a decade doing that work, um, but recognizing that the way to have the biggest impact, like you can do so much, right? But the biggest impact really um, came with being able to have that work directly drive the policies, which, um, which drove those inequities that we were trying to address. So that's actually what drew me to Mathematica. Um, and uh, about 18 months ago, over a year and a half ago. Um, that's that's sort of a, the brief snapshot shot of my trajectory. Okay, perfect. Uh, so what about you? How did you get involved in health equity research? Yeah, I won't get, I won't go back way, way, way back in my origin story, <laughs> but I will go back 20 years ago to the first day of um, my work here at Mathematica. When I started here at Mathematica 20 years ago, my first project was as a health analyst working on the Healthy Start Evaluation. Um, and I, actually my first day on the job was at a conference with Healthy Start grantees and Healthy Start's a program that's still going on today um, at the Maternal Child Health Bureau. And the focus is on eliminating health disparities in infant mortality. Um, so, you know, a, a often quoted statistic is that black moms and babies have twice the rate of infant death than white white moms and babies. And even then, even before social determinants of health became um, the terminology as it evolved, um, we were, Healthy Start was addressing enabling services, including transportation, childcare, and other support services. And I really just, um, as a public health, with a public health background, 
I, I just am really drawn to the fact that you can't really work on health as just healthcare as a silo and the fact that you have to address all of these other factors. So that's how I think I got my start work in health equity, which as Delia said, <laughs> we used to be called health disparities, healthcare for all, social determinants, and now health equity. And I think we're moving towards health justice, so. Okay, uh, by, by the way, we do see the, uh, the, the comment about closed captioning and we're working to address it. Um, so apologies that 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 isn't up it, it it's enabled on our streaming service but um this is our first time so please be patient with us as we figure out all the kinks with using linkedin live uh Kara, it, it, what what's the the origin story for you in terms of when you started to work in the area of health equity research I think I've also always worked in this space. Um, I come to the background with also from public health training with a focus on public policy and public um, and health policy. And so I'm interested in the intended and unintended consequences of policies overall, but also for a variety of different um, individuals with different you know, subgroups in society, whether that's by age, race, and gender, whether that is by um, you know, whether someone is a parent, whether someone has a disability. Um, and my work has really stemmed from mental disorders. And so really trying to um, understand that something that may, you know, look like it's beneficial for all may not be it, when we dig deeper into the data, both quantitative and qualitative. And so I too have been in this field for over 20 years. And so I really appreciate seeing how this work has, has developed. Glad to be here. Sarah, I, I think you're you're uh, you're going to round out the the crew here. Sure, what, sure. Uh, yeah, what started you out in health equity research? Yeah, so I've also like many of our of our discussions here have been in public health field of public health for a while, about a decade, um, but my entire career. Um, and I guess I was destined to be because my dad, when I was young, used to call me public health inspector. But um, in college. Um, <laughs> I certainly had a really strong focus on health education. I was teaching health workshops in New York City public schools. And when I started my master's training, um, also a master in public health, I really came to understand that education can only go so far without addressing the social and structural factors that impact all of our health and our opportunities in life. Um, and that my master's program, I also worked on a community-based participatory research project, which really helped instill in me the importance of doing, of doing community-engaged work uh, to accomplish these goals. Um, yeah, that's where, that's where it started. Uh, I'll leave it there. Okay. By the way, um, as some people may know this in the back, in my background, we've got the logo for Mathematica's podcast on the evidence uh, three of the people you're seeing on screen right now, uh, Kara, So, and Sarah, have all been guests on the podcast. I believe all of them have talked about health equity in some way. Uh, so and Kara, for example, talked about estimating the costs of untreated maternal mental health conditions and uh, health inequities in that space, particularly some research out of Texas that is really compelling. I would encourage folks to check it out. And please subscribe to our podcast. Um, so... Uh, uh, but and also, I'd also note uh, we're going to continue to get really great comments in the chat. Miranda Hill notes that yes, the distinction between disparities and inequities is such an important one that recognizes structural barriers. Thank you for that comment, Miranda. So I think some of our guests would be interested in knowing not just how you got started, but what is it like today in your current roles working in health equity research? And maybe we'll go in reverse order here. Sarah, we'll start with you. What is it like uh, working in uh, health equity research today? Okay, this is potentially the question I'm, I might be least prepared for, uh, but I will do my best. Um, so I, I guess I'll speak about doing health equity with Mathematica specifically. Um, I think one of the things that um, I've really enjoyed about doing equity work at Mathematica is the internal, the strong internal interest, even among those without a health equity background in understanding how to do and how to support this work. Um, and I think the other, another 
observation about working in health equity at Mathematica, it's really the challenge and the opportunity. So the challenge of balancing the way things have done, have been historically done, and some of the shifts we'd like to make, and also the opportunity of you know being able to help our clients make strides and lead our clients in uh, growing in this type of research. Okay, great. Well, if you if you felt at least prepared, you didn't didn't show just now. Um, uh, Kara, why don't we go with you now? Um, what's what's it like in your current role? I mean, one of the nice things about working in this space and also for Mathematica is you know, every day is different, right? It's not like we're doing the same thing all the time. We have so many different um, contracts and collaborators, both within and outside the company with strong interest in this area. And we do a variety of different kinds of research. Sometimes it's an, you know, an economic simulation model. Another time it might be a focus group. Another time we may be talking to, you know, state partners. So it, it, it there really is a wide range of interest. And I've been really encouraged to see more attention to some of these topics. You know, we're not just talking about how many visits did someone get and how much did they cost, but, you know, really, thinking about more some of these structural issues. And so in that sense, I think there's there's no one size fits all for this kind of work. And I think that that provides a lot of opportunities for, for all of us. Okay, so, and as I turn to you, I'm gonna cheat and, and try to uh, do a twofer here. We have, did have a question from somebody who's currently a graduate student in mathematics who's looking to work in, in research. Um, you know, for someone who's uh, looking for mentorship, uh, looking for, um, yeah, some some guidance. You know, wh how can they how can they uh, link up with people who are current in, currently in the field as you are and working in health equity research? And then maybe in addition to that, what 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 is it like today to work as a health equity researcher? It's funny because I was gonna. Um actually link uh, my answer a little bit to some of the mathematical statistical methods that we use when we do health equity research. So we're still using robust statistical and uh, economic methods when we do the policy research. But I think the difference is that when you're doing the health equity research, you're wondering, okay, what are the bias in these methods? What, what, um, what are the bias in the data entering? into the an analytical tool you're using. Um, and you're also thinking to yourself, is what I'm doing going to serve equity? You know, in the end, do my results serve equity? And, and my advice to, would be like, there's so many applications of math and mathematics. And I would, I would look um, at applied mathematics and there's applied mathematics at public health schools and uh, in economic research programs and so on. So that's, that's, I'm hoping I did the twofer. Yep. Yeah. I think that sounds good. Um, I, are there any associations or groups that, um, you know, someone, someone who's interested in getting this field should, should be joining? Um, Sarah, you're nodding your head. Any quick suggestions there that we should flag? Sorry, I was actually nodding at one of the question, one of the comments. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Although Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about um, APAM and and some of the associates, the groups that you're involved with? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I've been fortunate to be a part of two different health equity research related opportunities. Um, one is the Health Affairs Fellowship for Trainees, where they supported um, uh, researchers doing health equity focused work, um, providing mentorship. Um, and uh, support to, to, to publish some of our work. Um, and the, another set of opportunities was through the APAM, the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management. And they have a fellowship program, certainly for um, master's students, doctoral students, and early career professionals, but perhaps they also have programs for undergrads, um, that uh, it, it's a fellowship for um, uh researchers from underrepresented backgrounds um, and, you know, allows us entree into the APAM network, allowing us to attend the conference, again, receive mentorship from, uh, from scholars within APAM uh, and participate in um, uh, professional development uh, activities and sessions. 
oh, great. great, great opportunities. Um, and Eric, our comment chat comments chat is our section is uh, heating up. I'll I'll get back to some of those questions and comments in a second. But Delia, I I uh, I don't think we've heard from you yet about what it's like to work in health equity research. I mean, I think my colleagues have summed it up really well in terms of the experience at Mathematica. You know, Kara like hit the nail on the head in that no no day looks the same, right? And I'd even go as far as for me, often no hour looks the same, just sort of the different projects that I touch. And I think that's the same for most of us, right? You, you might be um, doing work in the federal space in one hour, and then you're with clients that are in the foundation space and state-based clients. And, um, you know, even we're doing equity work. Um, you know, with commercial clients as well. So it's really, really um, broad. I'd say it's challenging. And I mean that in a good way, um, because, you know, and I, I saw a comment in the chat that said um, degrees along, degrees al a degree is not enough to fix inequities. And I could not agree more um, because what I've experienced, despite having the degrees, I feel the real learning happens in the work that we're doing often alongside with our clients who are, in this space for the first time in a lot of you know in in a lot of instances and so it's it's really challenging in a good way in that it for, you're forced to think outside the box in order to bring our clients along in order to think about creative solutions to the the very real problems that our, our clients um the very real world problems that our clients that we're trying to answer with and alongside our, our clients so um you know to that end it's also very rewarding when we do see that end um and exciting because you know we're never bored it's it's it's, it's lots of really um it, it's real world stuff right and and you get to do it on a daily basis so um all in there okay um there are a couple questions that i'm going to try to combine um and kind of dovetail with something i was going to ask anyways which is i wanted i wanted to give folks uh a taste of real project work real real work that you're doing in the field um on health, health equity research and a few of the questions in the chat uh, specifically speak to, you know, where you think you're seeing the highest impact from projects. So perhaps um, uh, let's, uh, I don't know where, let's start with so. Um, is there, if, it, if you were to pick out an example of a project you are working on or have worked on in the past that uh, is in the health equity space, but also something where you feel proud of um, how it's, advancing policy or driving change, however you want to define impact, but where you, you feel like it's it's making a positive difference in the world. So I'm actually going to punt this to Kara okay. because I want her to talk about Texas PMADS. So Kara, I'm going to let yeah, you that was what I, that's I one of my, my favorite stories. So Well, and you know, as I said, I've been a researcher for many years and, th and this work that we did um, trying to assess the um, cost of untreated perinatal mood and anxiety disorders has been an example of research that has snowballed. You know, originally we were asked to uh, come up with financial estimates for the United States and then uh, three states that were associated with our foundation partners. And then afterwards, people and, and organizations have heard about and have reached out. So in the case of Texas, we were um, approached by a foundation that was getting ready to try to um, help their state make the case to extend, uh, to have Medicaid postpartum extension for up to 12 months. Uh, this was prior to when that became optional uh, under the APRA last year or the year before. And so they really um, wanted evidence to be able to bring to their, their partners, their legislature to say, okay, you know, can we, can you show that the, basically the cost of inaction and the disparities and you know inequity issues related to how different groups of individuals whether by race and ethnicity or by access to insurance status would affect uh, real costs and so we're happy to say that you know we conducted this work it was quite rapid turnaround we had a very short timeline um, but they used our work we were also connected to other uh, groups that, publicized the work so that the relevant stakeholders knew about it. And so when they came back to us and said, you know, we were able to make this case for you know, longer coverage postpartum, we really felt like that was a tangible impact of our work that could affect many people because, you know, as we know, 
experiences related to birth and delivery and potentially challenging health outcomes don't end necessarily within 60 days of birth, which is when a number of people lose access to health insurance. Um, before I, I let someone else answer this question, I just wanted to pivot back briefly to the, the previous question about um, how to uh, connect with, with researchers and mentors. Um, because in another hat that I wear, I'm a, a tenured professor. And I would say that one thing I often do, and I think others do in contacting me is look at people doing the work that interests you, you know, that's publicly available either through reports or issue briefs or peer reviewed papers and reach out to them directly by email. Um, it's, it's amazing how people will respond because they're interested in sharing this work and often need more help <laughs> to do it because there's so much work to be done. So that's at least one concrete suggestion I have in that area. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, and yeah, I would highly, highly recommend checking out that, that work in Texas and in general Mathematica's work um, on um, maternal mental health, maternal health. Uh, that does appear in one of our podcasts, but there are lots of other examples on our website. Um, I, I, is there, can we, can we surface one more example of a, a project that Mathematica has worked on where we were proud of how we're driving change? Sarah, so Delia. Well, since So punted it to Kara, I was going to punt it to So because I really want her to talk about the COVID work. Because Mathematica has done a lot of work during COVID, obviously, but I think some really high impact COVID work during the height of the pandemic that I think is important to talk about. Sorry, So. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's so much COVID work that we did, and I think some of it um, as related to equity was we were um, supporting several uh, communities and community-based organizations that were working within those communities to figure out in real time the uptake of vaccination and the demand and issues with myth and disinformation that were going on and what messages around uh, what kinds of misinformation was going on. So the community-based organizations had tools in their pockets yeah. to combat some of the mis and disinformation and help their communities um, understand what vaccination really meant, what were the risks, what it meant for them. Um, so I think that like there's kind of the higher level policy impact, but then you think about how you're supporting communities in making their own decisions and having their mm -hmm. own power in making their own decisions. And Delia, I don't know if you were thinking about the Biden administration influence as well, but we did some work um, with K through 12 schools that were working um, with grants from the Rockefeller Foundation to, and they got rapid COVID tests um, as part of that. And they, uh, we supported them in figuring out how best to um, deploy uh the the testing in their schools the the cadence of the testing given their community um burden of covid and so on and you know some of the best practices and the lessons learned from that um were taken by the rockefeller foundation and and helped uh provide uh contributing evidence to um the Biden administration's decision to invest $10 billion in testing in schools. So that was like a really big deal for us too. I know it's just a piece of contrib contributing information, but any little thing um, helps. So um, I'm seeing in the chat that we've got a really nice uh, showing. Um, I just want to welcome our, our, uh, our audience members from Georgetown, from the University of Washington, from Emory University. Um, uh, it's the University of Pennsylvania. Um, thanks so much for everyone who's who's joining us here today for this excellent conversation. Um, I imagine that uh, some of the people who are on this call might be interested in not only working in health equity research in general, but perhaps at Mathematica in particular. And we do have some experts who are on the talent acquisition side who I think can can speak to, um, you know. What it's like to work at Mathematica? How how do you how do you get started there? And so I do want to I do want to uh, uh, turn to some of some of those experts. Um, 
maybe uh, Corinne or, or Ife, what advice would you give to someone who is just starting out and would like, you know, is interested specifically in working at Mathematica? Sure. Ife, would you like to go ahead? You can start off since uh, Ife is really actively in the thick of uh, recruiting for health equity opportunities at Mathematica right now. Um, I'm happy to turn it to you, but I'm also happy to answer if you'd like. I mean, don't get me too excited now. This is this is the world I live in. Um, you know, to get started at Mathematica, something that I, and, and I'm really excited to be on here. I've actually seen some of the students that I've interviewed um, at job fairs who have popped on and, and dropped messages in here. Shout out to Lauren and whoever else is logged in. Um, but step one is apply. Um, you know, one of the things that we've noticed is, you know, there's a lot of um, connectivity has been made available through LinkedIn, people sending messages, people sending emails about, you know, positions that they're interested in or opportunities that they would like to explore, you know, requests for coffee about, you know, what's it like to work in Mathematica? Um, and what I have to tell you is the, the emails and the contacts that I get that bring me the most joy are those that are um, attached to a message that says, by the way, I've applied to XYZ position and I would love to learn more or, you know, getting specific um, about, uh, you know, what area that they're looking for. We have we have quite a few positions open right now and we get a lot of interest. And so when people can be a little bit more specific about the roles that they're interested in, um, it makes life a little easier. But um, yeah, I think you know opportunities like this uh, to, to to connect with 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 senior researchers, individuals who are doing the actual work. That's a great way as well to uh, sort of um, stand out um, as a candidate, as a way to to, to enter the the door of, of Mathematica. Uh, employee referrals are absolutely valuable to us because it helps make my job easier directing who should go where and when. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I could talk recruitment all day, every day. I do. I can add a little bit as well. I think you're, I totally agree with everything you've mentioned, Aoife, and, you know, there's a lot of great, you know, uh, advice and content in everything that you just mentioned. I would also, um, just as sort of a practical tip that, um, you know, I think is a bit unique to Mathematica compared to other organizations, I wouldn't underestimate the value of a of a good cover letter at Mathematica. Um, and, and you know, I've come around to understanding exactly why a cover letter is important when applying. Um, because I think especially for those just starting out in whatever field they're going into, it's really helpful for us to be able to look at all of this tangible information on a resume and say, okay, I see this person has done this and this, but also read a little bit about how you intend to or how you would like to take that experience that we already can see you have and apply it to certain policy topics or apply your experience to the broader, you know, realm or field of health equity um, specifically. I think it can be hard depending on, you know, depending on sort of where you are in your career, you may not yet have had the opportunity to really establish a lot of, you know, publications or a lot of work history that focuses specifically on health equity. But if you can take the experiences you have had and sort of build upon those and make um, some sort of argument basically for how you would intend to use your experiences to advance health equity or, um, you know, how your skills relate to some of the work that we've done, I think that can be really compelling and helpful for the people who ultimately look at your application. So I would just add that as a little like tip or technique in the uh, tactical process of applying. Okay. Oh, uh, just, I just wanted to flag, there are a few questions we've gotten in the comments that I think are nice uh, supplements to my original question. One was uh, uh, about, um, you know, you should should folks who are on this call today reach out to the researchers? Should they reach out to someone like Kara? Uh, are you know is that is that a recommended approach? Informational interviews with our with our experts. Um, anything else in terms of just sort of getting that your foot in the door or getting noticed or sort of establishing a relationship with Mathematica? 
Yeah, I mean, I can take a, I can take the first try at, at responding to that. So, I will say as a blanket statement, and this is a very pertinent comment that I'm about to make. We really, really um, place a lot of importance and value on providing an equitable and fair opportunity and experience to those who apply to our positions. Um, and so, for that reason, you know, we really take the application process. Um, you know, we 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 do more than anything else, we're looking at the various elements that go into that application and, you know, really being thoughtful about how, you know, the, the elements that we can see align with the job at hand. So, you know, I just want to put out there as a blanket statement, that is always the best way to demonstrate and to get noticed by, by the folks reviewing your application. But I absolutely think that, you know, it's great to request, um, you know, to, to connect with people on LinkedIn. I'm guessing all of the folks you saw earlier would be happy to um, connect with people on LinkedIn. I think um, I would actually say that that Aoife and I are great people to, to talk to and request conversations with. That way we can sort of keep the process equitable and make sure that we're directing you in a way that, um, that you know, is fair compared to all of the other folks in the process. Um, so I'll stop for a second. Aoife, is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm reading some of these comments, and and I, they're they're wonderful and very spot on. But I would agree that you know, on the one hand, I think generally speaking, our researchers um, and and consultants are happy to engage with interested individuals, and nine times out of ten, they will forward um, those. Um, uh, in, uh, inquiries or messages or notes to us, and so we can then, you know, you know, take the mantle and and, and keep pushing the the conversation forward from a recruitment standpoint. Um, at the same time, I do think that um, it is important to also understand that we wish we could hire everyone, um, but in the same breath, you know, we post positions and we often get three, four, five hundred applications in in a couple of weeks span and so the applications that tend to stand out are those that are complete so if the position requires you know a cover letter you know a uh sorry a writing sample um those sort of things making sure that you have a complete application um and then again if you are reaching out to corinne or i or any of the rest of the members of our town acquisition team that you're being specific about what you're looking for um i mean we we have examples of individuals who've applied for 16 positions over the last few years who received offers in the last you know three months or so so that persistence is also um important um and again i don't think there's there's, there's nothing wrong and it's often encourage yes to reach out to seek more information but understanding that it is our responsibility speaking about you know equity in the grand scheme of things is our responsibility to ensure that every candidate has an equitable experience every time even if they're not selected right and what that means is we try our best to review every candidate and make sure that there's alignment before we move them forward so i think i mean i think corinne you you got you got it right um uh you got it right when you said it and 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 jb i was wondering if i could just respond to there was a question about a cv versus a, a resume um and uh i have to be very transparent with you um i have yet to in my career um disqualify a candidate because they submitted one or the other um, now because we have the um differentiation of being more research focused academic focused there can be the tendency to lean more towards the cv academic performance route um, but again as corinne said what's going to set you apart is not necessarily your cv it's how do you tell the story of what you've done and how it applies to what you want to do here at Mathematica. And that comes in the cover letter, right? Where you're telling the story of, yes, I've done all these things um, or I've done this academic work and this is what I want, how I want to apply it in a, for a current position at Mathematica. Yeah, I'll also, sorry, I'll just step in also and say it is helpful, I think, um, to show the publication, so like if you have a publication list, even you don't have to include the whole CV, but we always love to see sort of a publication list or conference list or things that you have um, sort of put out into the world in terms of your work. Um, but, you know, we are, I think a lot of people think of us as like a, a very research um, and evaluation and, and, you know, very... Um, 
is sort of academic adjacent environment. And in a lot of ways we really are, but there's also work that we do that is very more on the side of program improvement and, and um, you know, consulting and technical assistance where those jobs, you know, sometimes we love to see, um, you know, it, it, a CV would not necessarily be um, as helpful to us uh, for, for jobs that focus on that end of the spectrum. So I would say, you know, carefully read the 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 job and sort of how it leans. And um, if it is a heavily research oriented job, I think a CV can work. Otherwise, a list of publications in addition to your resume is always is always great. So there, there are a, a few questions we're going to try to batch together here. And by the way, I really appreciate seeing that in the comments. We have one of our audience members is Jen Kirk, who was a, a guest on our podcast I and know. a summer, <laughs> summer fellow. And I think the summer fellowship program is probably something that uh, answers one of the questions. So, you know, there are a few questions about, you know, how do you, um, what, what other than getting a PhD and being hired as a researcher at, at that level, what are some other ways that you could enter the organization? Um, uh, I think maybe like an analyst position, for example, you talked about program improvement, Corinne, Corinne, um, uh, but then, but then someone also was asking about what about, you know, uh, shadowing or, um, you know, opportunities to sort of prototype working at Mathematic on a short term basis. So could you talk a little bit about the summer internship program, the summer fellowship program, and um, and positions that don't require a PhD. And maybe if Sarah's still available, I would love for her to to chime in too about um, Sarah Leaf about her experience with the summer fellowship. Hi there. <laughs> um, well, let's see. How should we do this? Uh, 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 maybe uh, Sarah, do you want to brief speak uh, speak briefly to the summer fellowship and? Um, and, and, and sort of that, that trajectory for you from being a fellow to now your job here? Yeah, absolutely. So I applied for Mathematica Summer Fellowship when I was in my doctoral program. Um, and I applied uh, in between my fourth and fifth years, I believe, because the, you know, one of the purposes of the Summer Fellowship, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but in my experience was really to support uh, uh, folks who are wrapping up their dissertation research to support us in, in finishing up, uh, you know, the dissertation, as well as providing opportunities for, for networking and learning from the folks who work at Mathematica, what are the types of projects they do, what do they like about what they do, what don't they like about what they do, um, as well as um, shadowing some projects. So I had the opportunity to, you know, read some proposals and other documents and attend some meetings. Um, my experience was a little bit different because it was during the height of the pandemic. So unfortunately I wasn't in person, uh, but it was still an incredible experience. And I applied, you know, for a position at Mathematica as, as soon as I graduated. <laughs> um, I guess the other thing I will say, as you guys were talking about apply, 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 I applied for the summer fellowship twice and I didn't get it the first time, <laughs> but I did the second time. So, so keep trying. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah. Yeah. So it, I, um all of that I remember so clearly the <laughs> the 2020 summer fellowship <laughs> go like what do we do um but uh yeah so Sarah just to kind of put um like a very high level bow on what Sarah mentioned I think the fellowship correct you know it is the type of um, opportunity where people will often bring their independent research interests into, so so they apply with a proposal to do some sort of work over the summer that generally will be part of or relate to their dissertation, but doesn't necessarily have to, to be that, but often it is. Um, so you apply to Mathematica f to the fellowship with the goal of essentially kind of doing work that you drive that's relevant to your research interests with the support of people from Mathematica. Um, so the benefit is that you get all this mentoring and you get some resources and you get to sort of bounce ideas off of people. I mean, I haven't done it myself, but that's that's the impression I get. Um, and then that differs a little bit from our internship programs. So our internships are a little bit more, you know, uh, we at Mathematica have projects, we have you know, goals, we have assignments, and we let our interns work on those things that we're sort of directing. Um, so we do have a 
a, an internship program that is in its third year, and I think it's been pretty successful. Um, usually we hire interns who are at sort of the bachelor's level or master's level, but um, we have in the past hired PhD level interns. Again, the main difference being that we are sort of asking them to support our work versus them bringing their own research interests in and us um, mentoring that. Um, so certainly internships are available. Um, we, you know, I would say that if you feel like you are, if there's something that you can bring to Mathematica, if, even if you're not ready for a full-time position, you can reach out to us. And, you know, sometimes it is sort of a matter of opportunity. If there is a time when we are, you know, we're we're running low on a certain skill set. And even if somebody comes to us and, and says, hey, I have skills in this area and I would love to intern with you for a little while, is there an opportunity? Sometimes we can consider that. So um, the best source of up to the minute information about what we're actively searching for is going to be on our career site. Um, but yeah, there are other opportunities too. And then also just to touch on the last thing, the analyst role is a great uh, position for people who are, you know, maybe have a little bit of um, experience post bachelor's degree or have, you know, relatively recently graduated with a master's degree. Uh, there is no ceiling here where you can't become a researcher just because you don't have a PhD, which I think is amazing. It's a really unique part of Mathematica. Yeah, and just to, to, to contribute to what Corinne just said, I think, um, you know, one of the exciting things about working at Mathematica and Town Acquisition is a couple of things. It's one, uh, when we publish our, um, our our postings and our job postings, one, you'll notice for the majority of our postings that in the experience section, it talks about a combination of education and experience. And we truly do look at that, you know, so um, just as a general statement, as a sort of general guideline from a recruitment standpoint, you know, at the associate level, we're looking at individuals with a bachelor's degree or kind of early career. This is kind of your first foray into uh, the world of research or business or analytics or whatever it is, depending on your subject matter area. At the analyst level, these are individuals with, you know, a few years of experience or have recently graduated or are about to graduate with their master's programs. That can be an MPH, an MSW, uh, master's in public administration, public policy, um, you know, a wide variety of things. Um, or again, somebody with the bachelor's with, you know, maybe five, six, seven years of work experience. When we get to our researcher managing consultants, policy consultant roles, those are typically individuals with master's degrees and, you know, a few years of experience in their research area or individuals who are graduating in the next cycle with their doctoral program. So, you know, we have individuals who are in the organization at the senior researcher level who do not have doctorate degrees, um, but they have been subject matter experts for some time and have worked their way to, to that level. So there's there's many ways to get into the organization. Um, for those of you that were asking specifically about not having a PhD, you'll typically see, again, if you're earlier in your career and you have your master's, you're going to be likely being considered more so for analyst level positions. Um, and the nice thing about all of this is we publish our salary ranges. So if anyone has ever followed me on LinkedIn, you'll know that I'm a huge advocate for pay transparency as a way to, to create equity um, across um, the gender pay gap. And so we post our salary ranges uh, for the our target offers. And so that'll also kind of help you see where things stand from a, from a compensation standpoint. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can wrap up with a little bit of a future looking question and, and uh, bring back some of our uh, research experts as well, kind of bridge the two elements of our uh, expert panel here. Um, if we're looking out five, 10 years into the future in terms of health equity research, you know, where is the field going? Where are there going to be needs? And if you're somebody who is at the beginning of your career and wants to work in this space, what are, you know, what should you be focusing on? What skills should you be trying to develop? Um, you know, are there are there certain statistical packages or uh, uh, courses you should be taking? Or you know, what advice would you have for somebody who you want who would want to be kind of a leader or a pioneer in this space in five to ten years? 
Um, and let's see, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pick on, who have we got? Delio, I'll pick on you first. I was like, not me, not me. Um, I, I can answer that. So I, I think I'll, I'll tackle the first part of your question, which is sort of where is this going? Where are we going? What's sort of the future state of health equity um, look like? And I just say, you know, broadly, just ripe with opportunity. You know, I think the last couple of years since COVID and, um, you know, and the relentless and ongoing murders of black and brown men and women finally being recorded for the world to see, um, it meant that we're finally having an open dialogue about inequities, right? It is, it, it's not going anywhere. And we're finally talking about it um, and the systems that create and perpetuate these inequities, right? And so after decades of quite frankly, just talking about differences in outcomes, we're finally um, starting to see more discussion and research about the root causes of, of inequities. And so the recognition, the recognition that we really need um, more interventions at the structural level, um, addressing root causes and the entrenched systems of oppression that really got us to this place, right? And so I think it's, it's there's a lot laying ahead of us. And I think, you know, to me, we're just starting to scratch the surface and this is the tip of the iceberg. And we're finally sort of where we, where we, it would have been nice to have been where 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I think when many of us started our careers. And so I think it's an exciting space to be in for that reason, because now the real work can actually begin. Um, and so I, I would sort of, you know, encourage early career folks who are just getting into this field to, to really engage. And I think, you know, it's, it's not just one type of um, discipline or expertise that it requires to address health inequities. And so even at Mathematica, right, we have so many different um, disciplines. We have economists, we have sociologists, we have sort of traditionally trained um, disparities researchers, we have, you know, clinicians, we have, so it, it requires all of those perspectives, it requires all of those skill sets to um, address the complex challenging problems that we have at bay. And so, um, you know, I, 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 it's not a one size fits all approach to this. And I think that's the excitement about um, the, the opportunity at Mathematica is it, it, you can be a methodologist, you can be, you know, sort of more of a strategy thinking person or like a, you know, technical assistant. So there's a lot of opportunity in this field. Kara, I feel like it's, yeah, could, uh, what, what, sure. what would you recommend? Well, to follow up on that, I think, I don't necessarily think like, oh, you have to know this particular statistical method or package. And in some sense, I would really encourage people to be true to themselves as to what they believe that they're interested in. And then also recognize that what you want to learn and do may evolve over time. You know, I was very heavily quantitatively focused in earlier in my career. And now I've really embraced work in, in qualitative methods, including personal narratives, you know, and each has a role. And one of the nice things about many of the projects that we have is that, you know, you have people on teams with a wide range of backgrounds, both, you know, interpersonally, but also in terms of their skill. And you can learn and you can have opportunities to, you know, get a chance to do a, a technique or an experience that you haven't had before. And in some ways, I also really encourage people to come in with their mind open. You know, when I came to Mathematica, I thought I was going to be working on really huge, you know, evaluations for uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And I ended up working on really tiny uh, foundation projects. And I've loved it. it. You know, and you just you just don't know. And some of it may have to do with the topics or the moments or the administration. Like there's so many different factors. So I guess I would argue to keep an open mind but but i don't think there's any like well if you know this then it works and if you don't then it doesn't it, you know it's it's much more um i don't know there's many more opportunities than that um be before i let other people respond i did see a few questions in the chat that i thought i might be able to answer quickly one was um what opportunities are there to expose yourself to mathematics as a master's student uh, one, one of the answers to that, I think, would be conferences. Uh, for example, we have Mathematica often has uh, booths, like at the Association for Public Policy and Management, the APAM Fall Research Conference. Mathematica has a booth. You should definitely stop by and say hello. Um, and I, I would check. Uh, oh, Academy Health. Thank you, Kara. Uh, and uh, the APHA, which would be the American Public Health Association, I believe. So those are three right off the top. Um, if you go to Mathematica's website with events, or if you follow or if you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll see other places where we we pop up. Um, but definitely say hello to us at at conferences. That could be a good way. 
Uh, is the summer fellowship open to only doctoral student uh, students and candidates? Uh, that answer to that is yes. It's only right. It, according to my but not technically. Uh, technically, anyone can apply. Um, I would just clarify, though, that you are basically the purpose is to advance your own research, right? So it it's a little harder to, you know, to put that all together and make a proposal if you're not, you know, sort of in the process of your dissertation. But but technically, anyone could apply. Okay. The other question I saw in the chat was, uh, is this being recorded? The answer is yes. So it will be available to watch later. So if you came late or if you just uh, wanted to re-listen to someone's responses, you'll have the opportunity to do so. All right. Who wants the final word on uh, the, fu the future of uh, health equity research and, and how to be, um, how to prepare for that, that work? I'll oh, do it. Okay. So... <laughs> So I think that at the moment, what we're trying to do right now is undo the health, the systems and policies that perpetuate the health inequities. I think the future will be about how to build systems to sustain equity and to always ensure equity. Um, and I would say the skills that people need are to understand, do systems level thinking, thinking that considers all of the complexity we have in the world and how things are interconnected. I think that that is probably a key conceptual skill that spans across all disciplines, all sectors that is important to, to have when you do the health equity work beyond challenging yourself and your biases day to day. Oh. So that is what I, I would say is my final word. Okay, that that is a, a good final word. Well, I see that we're uh, we have about two minutes remaining. Um, let me see if there were any. Um, okay, uh, you, to, uh, to, to Tamara also asks if this will, recording will be posted afterwards. Anywhere it sh it should be available on LinkedIn. Um, it's currently on LinkedIn, but once once the event has finished wrapping up you'll be able to find it, I believe, on the Mathematica LinkedIn page. And we will make sure it's posted and available and we will be promoting uh, promoting it too. I'm sure that uh, we'll promote it on our other social platforms to make sure people are aware of the conversation and can tap into it as a resource. Uh, we have a minute remaining, so I'm gonna wrap up and say thank you first to our excellent, um, oh, can we say hi to Sarah? Wait, Sarah. Sarah's mom is is among our audience. Sarah, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. And um, uh, hi, Sarah's mom. Hi, Sarah's mom. <laughs> hi, Sarah's mom. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank everyone else who 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 joined us. Uh, our expert uh, panel of guests, as well as our audience members, we had terrific questions and comments. And um, please reach out if you are interested in working for or with Mathematica. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, JB. Thanks, JB. Thank you.